Hey there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics. Sorry I haven't been producing very many videos lately, but I was busy prepping Sonic and then competing with it at Maker Battle recently, and a lot of other stuff has come up that's prevented me from editing usual videos. So I'm going to be showing you a video that I recorded back at the October NHRL event with Ben from Team Panic, who came all the way from Australia to see the event, and both of us have pretty similar sized YouTube channels, so I asked my audience if they had questions for him, and I will be presenting his answers to all those questions in the video coming forward. Uh, I hope to get my Maker Battle recap with my new Antweight bot Sonic ready at some point in the next couple weeks, but haven't had much time to sit down and edit, so here is a bit of an unusual video to kind of fill that time. Also, I'd like to thank today's video sponsor, PCBWay, off the bat. PCBWay has sponsored both myself and Team Panic in the past, in fact, so they are really helping both of us create better combat robotics content for all of you. Make sure to check out PCBWay for CNC machining, 3D printing, and PCB fabrication at the link in the description. Editor's note, uh, the audio from this is pretty wonky because it turned out only the microphone that Ben was wearing ended up recording properly, so I had to kind of boost the audio levels from everything that I said, so if it sounds very weird and the background levels keep changing, that is why. Hello everybody, this is Steph Safer from Team Just Cause Robotics, and I am here with Ben from Team Panic. Hello! Uh, we thought that we would do a quick little Q&A with you guys and ask each other questions that our audience has. So I'm going to start out. Uh, first several questions that I have are about Australia and uh, basically the differences between Robot Combat in Australia and the United States. So question number one from at Tinker Tutorials Olin is uh, basically what weight class, how are the differences between Australia and the US compared to which weight classes are the most saturated and what classes are still kind of the wild west in Australia? Right, okay. So Australia is interesting because there's kind of like an old guard and a new guard. There's some guys who have been fighting 30 pounds forever basically and then they all started fighting in like early 2000s and earlier even than that when radio tech and everything was massive. So they didn't touch insect weight at all pretty much because it was just difficult to do. And then there's a whole bunch of us who have started more recently who get into ant weights and beetle weights and our ant weights are 150 grams. I think that's our most saturated class in Australia right now. There's four or five different groups that run like monthly ant weight meets that do pretty well in terms of how many ant weights show up. And then there is also our 30 pounders who, those of us who are new to the building are building 30 pounders and you've still got the old guard building 30 pounders as well. So, but they only have one fight a year for those. So it's kind of hard to call that a saturated class. Beetles are kind of the wild west still. There's not been that many beetle fights uh, in Australia, only a couple of years worth. So we're all still kind of finding our feet and every now and again, somebody pulls something out and it's like, oh, that's a bigger weapon than anybody's ever had before. Right, we all need to build to stop that weapon now. Okay. So. so in Australia, the, the beetle weight class is 1.5 kilograms. Right? It's not actually, we still run the three pounds. Uh, it's the UK that's gone over to 1.5s. There was a little bit of discussion in Australia when they did that as to whether or not we were going to do that and we decided to stick it with our three pounds. Okay. So you're 1.36 kilogram basically. Yeah, and correct. And the 13.6 kilogram is 30 pound, right? Yes, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we just convert the pounds into kilos and run whatever that ends up being. Cool. Yeah. Um, another question that's basically asking about major differences between Australia and the US and if there's anything that you are excited to see come to either region. Mm, that is interesting. I think the thing I'm excited for from America, especially from NHRL where we are right now, back to Australia is TPU. TPU is not used in our Beetle division all that much at the moment, but it is just prolific here. Yeah, so I have built a TPU one pounder, which I'm going to take back home with me and hopefully put it into the three pound class and spur some people into TPU printing at home. So. So, on a related note, Ice Builds Robots wants to know if you think Australia would benefit from a one pound class. That is an interesting question. I feel like the 150 gram class and the one pound class kind of meet the same brief almost as a like lower cost 
lower weight entry um, where physics don't quite match what you get in beetles and up. Like I feel like beetles is your first weight class where the physics in a beetle and the physics in a feather, if you scale them up, kind of line up. Whereas when you go lower than that, the physics is all a little bit wonky because the power to weight is just off yeah. the charts. So I found that with like going from like a one pound to a three pound, is you kind of at one point a lot of times on 150 gram, you can get away with slapping a weapon directly to your motor. Yes. I found out the hard way with subtraction, even trying to modify a motor to take that force in three pound is extremely hard to make that work because the inertia of the robot compared to the, to the power that they all have in the same. Like I think that probably the most power dense brushless motors pretty much are what you're using in three pound robots. Yeah, oh for sure. And yeah, so as to whether Australia would benefit, I think maybe is the answer to that. Because our 150 gram class is probably our most saturated class, having that extra class would maybe like spread some builders out a little bit. So that could be interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure it will happen, but it would be interesting. Yeah. Um, another thing, I'm not entirely sure what is meant by this question, but Hands of Rhythm 3415 wants to know, what would it take to start up a true Australian national combat robotics competition? So I'm assuming they're referencing NHRL as our national competition here in the US. Probably. Uh, more builders, basically, is, is the answer to that. So Australia, we've only kind of got four or five clubs right now, and each club has got a handful up to kind of 20, 25 plus members. Uh, there was more people at NHRL than I think fight in Australia, full stop. So <laughs> we need more builders. And, I mean, we do kind of have a national league, it's just, it fights once a year and it fights 30 pounders. Okay. Uh, and and they so... Don't, they don't run anything except 30s? They don't run they anything don't. except 30s. Um, is that the one that the Death Roll team hosts? Yes, that's the one that the Death Roll team hosts. Um, I think there have been some talks about them doing, like, Beatles and Ants as well at some points, but a lot of the time that kind of, especially, Previously, where there weren't that many ant and beetle builders around, that kind of all fell by the wayside a bit. Maybe they'll do some more ants and beetles now that we're getting more of those classes out. Yeah, certainly good. All right, um, some questions more related to you personally. Is it challenging, or ICR8962 wants to know, is it challenging to source affordable parts due to being located in Australia? Yes, <laughs> very much so. Um, I mean, we are kind of close to China, but even then, <laughs> there is the Australia tax, yeah. which is just like anything that gets shipped to Australia costs a ton in shipping. It takes two weeks at a bare minimum. Um, yeah, the amount of access you guys have to parts, tools, components is mind blowing. Yeah. So. The US has really taken off, especially with NHRL expanding in the three pound category. And like the above classes now to a lesser extent. And uh, I think that there's there's been a much bigger demand for parts here, which is partly why like all the supply is mostly coming from North America, though you have finger tech, of course, in Canada. It's still yeah. North America, but not in the US. Yeah, I mean, look, getting things from finger tech is expensive and time consuming. As somebody who's done that, yeah. so. Very fair. Um, what are the travel logistics like? for such long trips to compete, which tools are important enough to bring along with you and what gets left behind? Everything gets left behind, <laughs> basically. Uh, the logistics are interesting. The one thing that I do personally with my robots, I try and build, if I know I'm building a robot that's gonna be taken overseas, I'm building it so that I take as few tools as possible, which means stuff like avoiding hex head bolts because I can't bring an Allen key for every different size of bolt or I don't you know like that's wasting tool space in a bag so if you throw Phillips heads on everything one screwdriver takes the whole robot apart so at that point the logistics are you take just enough tools to get the robot from a complete state to a flat state and back again and anything else you're gonna need like a hacksaw or a dremel or a drill to like make gross modifications or big repairs you're kind of relying on the kindness of the people around you to have those things and lend them to you when you need them because 
especially a hammer. Like a hammer is so much weight and so much space that you just can't pack one when you fly internationally. So that's good to know. Yeah, I haven't actually. I technically haven't flown with a robot to a competition before because when I went to Open Source, which was 3,000 miles away in San Francisco, but because I was staffing the event. NHRL took my box from me. I met up with them halfway between where I live and Norwalk. They took my, like, Edgeman Sam personally picked up my stuff and had it driven all the way across the country wow. and driven all the way back. That's... So I just flew with my backpack and, like, a few little things. That's a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> um, whatever happened with your tangential drive system? Uh, it got put on hiatus, basically. It was interesting in that it was forcing my, like, to get it to work properly, it would have to force my designs away from where they currently sit. Uh, because the big thing about tangential drive is that you really need the system to be rigid and maintain a good tension between the wheel and the tangential drive system. So you kind of need both rigidity and flexibility in just the right ways. And yeah, I basically would have needed to build a robot from the ground up to have a good tangential drive in it. It would have been like, do the tangential drive properly, build a robot around that. So. Uh, the interesting thing about tangential drive is like the, back, the maximum benefit you get is like you have just the tiny motor shaft and like you can wheel for a good reduction, right? Yeah. What I've seen a lot of the Brazilian teams do, they, a lot of them use tangential drive, is they'll have like a little sleeve that is grooved, like or knurled that goes over yeah. the motor shaft, and you lose some of that benefit there that you would get from not using gears. You just get the, compact, the flat compactness of having it just be the shaft in the wheel instead of having an extra layer of gears, like I had on Division for a while. Yeah. But you also like you're still just relying on just biting into like a rubbery surface with just the right amount of tension to make that work. Yeah, I mean, and that was the other thing. So I knew that the Brazilians did like no shafts and things, and I never got to that level. And I needed, I probably needed to get to that level, but that is a level of machining that at the time I didn't have access to. Yeah. Now I could like, you know, PCB weigh that and that would work out. But at the time I didn't have access to it. So I kind of was like, oh, this next step up to like make this work better, I just can't do. Yeah, so. that makes total sense. Um, another couple questions which might be the same answer are, uh, how did you come up with the dual spinner Realty train and what was your hardest robot to build? <laughs> they kind of are, yeah. So the dual spinner melty brain has been causing me lots of problems. Uh, it's not actually my hardest one to build, though. My hardest one to build was a robot called Flop, which was a half weight, like like a uh, featherweight multi that is a winch drive flipper, winch drive YOLO flipper. So it has a big brushless motor running a shaft, yeah, that drags a rope down winch style and pulls the flipper arm down. I kind of like the dollar store version of Blip. Yeah. No flywheel, it was just like the motor just like wraps a cord to actuate the arm. Yeah, yeah, exactly it. Uh, that was a very, very difficult build because I didn't give myself enough time to build it. Yeah. And I'd committed to going to the event, it was, like away from me in, in Brisbane, I bought flights, I'd ho got hotels, like, and I went all the way down to the wire on that build and I just had lots of niggly little problems because it was a first time build and it was the first time with me trying that system out and stuff. It was stressful. Uh, how the Vert Melty came about was a whole different story involving three BattleBots rejections. So basically I, kept giving BattleBots what I thought was a cool, interesting design. And when they rejected me, I was like, right, how do we make this crazier? How do we make this better? And that ended up with Zap, and then they rejected Zap. And I was like, well, the next step is to take those horizontals and turn them vertical and just see what happens. So that's, that's how we got to here. Uh, you know, and I also, I kind of feel like I would have done it at some point anyway, because what does that do? How does that work? Like, <laughs> somebody needs to do it and see how it works, uh, what happens. So. It is very unique and very cool. On a similar Thanks. note, what is an experimental bot that sounded great on paper, but in practice wasn't very competitive? 
for me, I think that's pretty much what shrapnel mine is to a T. Like, I built it, and it wasn't very good. I tried to make it better, and it was even worse somehow. Yeah, yeah, you, you definitely get robots like that. Um, for me personally, what is the most... Because I've done a bunch of experimental things in the ant weight class. You've done a lot more experimental things than I have, because I pretty much only built three pounds, and they're way more expensive than 150 gram pounds. Yeah, so I mean, that's and that's the thing. That's why, like, going back to the question from before about, like, one pound versus 150 gram, I think the other thing there is that I still personally feel like 150 grams are a lot easier and quicker to build than a one pound even, so it's you can... It's hard to import parts into the country, too, like... Well, starting a whole new weight class and having to have an entire new like economy of parts within the country, I feel like yeah, that's gonna that's going to be difficult for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I've built a lot of experimental robots in ants, but I think for me, because I do a lot of my experimenting in ants, none of them are really like wasted potential because if they don't work, it's just one event that they go to and they don't yeah. perform as well as I expected them to, and I throw them out again, you know. So. Um, and I, I often tend to remember the experimental things that work way better than I ever thought they would. Like, I put a spinner out the side of an ant weight at one point, expecting it to just be crazy and lose every fight, and it ended up, like, placing second for the event or something, and I was like, ha ha what? How? Ha sure, okay. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Um, one question I had for you. Yeah. Uh, kind of a two-parter. What was the original motivation for starting your YouTube channel, and why do you keep making videos? Okay, uh, so my motivation is kind of twofold on this one. Uh, the first one is I like showing this stuff off. I like helping people out. I like kind of the idea that anybody can do this. And so part of the channel is being like, well, especially when I started out, I was living in an apartment you know, I was drilling on a blow mold table by like, clamping things to the edge of a blow mold table. And I was like, if I can do this, you out there can do this. And if I keep putting videos out, maybe they'll get to the right people and somebody will go, hey, I can build a combat robot. Um, so there's that whole part of it for me. And that's also why I do tutorials and stuff is like, I want to help out as much as I can. And then on top of that, I personally work better when I've got deadlines to hit. So by having a video out every week, I'm always working on robot things. It keeps me innovating things. It keeps me working on robots. It keeps me repairing things, you know. It keeps me like even reflecting on fights. Like all my fight recaps, I do that to show off how my fights went, but I also do that so that I take the time, sit down, rewatch all my fights, go, oh, I broke that weapon and I thought I broke it by hitting them, but actually I did it by hitting the wall or like spinning up at the wrong time or whatever. And it's interesting how much you pick up again when you go back to a fight, especially when in the fight you're just like tunnel vision driving and you think you know what happened and then you watch the fight back and you're like, no, I didn't yeah. actually, it I, didn't stick. Totally can relate to that, yeah. My event recaps are very frequently, I'm like, oh wait, I totally thought that I hit them once and then they died. But then I watched the fight back and there were like eight exchanges that I completely forgot to even happen. Yeah. Oh, that's so easy to do. Yeah. Um, all right, we're moving on to the, the sillier questions now. Um, Grant Pat done 3417 wants you to let him know what is the powerhouse of the cell? <laughs> <laughs> Mitochondria. Hey, I think that is the correct answer. Which I never did biology, but I think... <laughs> uh, we had like four people ask you to do my intro, which I guess you'll do for your video. I will do that for my video, so if you want to see that, it is on my channel. Now, maybe. <laughs> um, Alex is Alchemy, another combat robot builder who's been doing YouTube videos about his ant weight cheesecake. What's I have now? seen that, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very really great. Do you panic at the disco more than you panic at other places? No, I panic at robot events more than anywhere else. There is a reason that my team is called Team Panic, and it is a very apt reason. It is because 
half the time I'm like still building right up until I'm safe being, so. I feel like that is a universal construct of combat robot. Uh-huh, yeah. I just decided to immortalize that in my team name, so. The last like three seasons, like Bloodsport has not had like a successful weapon test before we showed up. Where we've had like weird things that we couldn't quite figure out what was going on. Yeah. Right after we showed up at BattleBots. <laughs> like a day or three, like figuring it out. Yeah, yeah. It's been very fun. <laughs> That will happen, for sure. Um, Saxon215 wants to know, is it hard for you to drive with the controls upside down? See, I, I've got used to this now. This is my fifth international competition. Uh, so I've actually got a special mode on my transmitter where I can hold it upside down and all the controls work again. So we're all good on that one. That took a little bit of figuring out. Uh, that's, you know, BuggleBots was interesting trying to get all that sorted, but we're, we're set now. And uh, similarly, Craig Bowie, 8925, wants to know, does every robot in Australia need magnets so it doesn't fall out of the arena? Uh, no, there's an anti-gravity uh, anti system sitting on the edges of the arena just uh, to keep them all up onto the top where they need to be to drive. So, yeah, I, the hardest part about all of this is flipping the footage afterwards so that it's, you know, the right way around for you guys oh, to yeah. watch. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I think that's all I've got for you. Cool, thank you. Uh, so as mentioned guys, there is a one of these on my channel where I have asked Seth a whole bunch of questions from my YouTube comments. So uh, if you watch both of us, maybe your question is in there. If you don't, check it out because you might learn something about Seth you didn't know already. So awesome. Yeah, definitely subscribe to the Team Panic channel. And uh, if you're not subscribed to Seth already, you're here. Or, the button is right there. Just click it. See you in the next video. Bye. Well, he will. <laughs>